Hi, software engineers. A very important part of being a good software engineer is learning to work with others, both in a team or within a company, but also working with others as far as society goes and being a responsible member of the greater community. So today we're gonna to talk about the software engineering code of ethics. Have you ever thought about just how much power software has in people's lives? It controls our money, it controls transportation, it controls traffic lights for heaven's sakes. Um, if as an engineer, you were ever derelict in your duties, what could potentially happen? Now you might think to yourself, well, I, you know, I plan on working on, you know, grandma's recipe maker 9000. I'm not planning on working on critical infrastructure software, but everything plays a role and everything has an effect on people's lives in some way. So what responsibility do you have to society at large for the quality of your products? Um, have you seen unethical behavior from software developers before? I mean, there are examples out there, certainly, and we can, we can get into some of those, but, but think about that for a moment. Have you ever really thought about, wow, you really didn't test this, or wow, did you really think about how this software might be used? Or how could you release a piece of software with known critical failures in it when something could potentially happen? So we need to have some guiding principles as software engineers to make sure that we are trying to be as conscientious as possible and to be responsible for the products that we create. Now, I do want to show you a clip here. Now, if you've never seen this, this is from Office Space. And um, I'm just gonna let the, the clip speak for itself. All right, so when the subroutine compounds the interest, right, it uses all these extra decimal places that just get rounded off. So we simplified the whole thing and we just we round them all down and just drop the remainder into an account that we opened. So you're stealing? Uh, no, no, you don't understand. It's, uh, it's very complicated. It's, uh, it's, it's aggregate, so I'm talking about fractions of a penny here, and uh, over time, they add up to a lot. Oh, okay. So you're gonna make a lot of money, right? Yeah. Right? That's not yours? Uh, well, it, it becomes ours. How is that not stealing? I don't think, uh, I don't think that I'm explaining this very well. Um, okay. The 7-Eleven, right? Mm -hmm. You take a penny from the tray, from the crippled children? No, that's the jar. I'm talking about the tray. The, the you know, the pennies for, for everybody. Oh, for everybody. Okay. Yeah. Well, those are whole pennies. Right. All right? Uh -huh. I'm just talking about fractions of a penny here, okay? But we do it from a much bigger tray, and we do it a couple of million times. So what's wrong with that? All right. So what's wrong with that? Now, the, the software engineering character whose name is escaping me right now is, is explaining to his girlfriend, Jennifer Aniston, about this algorithm that they're working on. It And the, if you've never seen Office Space, I, I suggest you go do so um, at some point. Um, there's some quality memes. That, uh, TPS reports comes from this. Or, you know, like, ah, I need you to come in over the weekend. So there's some, there's some quality computer science memes from this movie. So it's worth going to see or finding um, legally. Um, so. He's working on some banking software effectively that is, you know, it's doing calculations, but as we know, math is, you know, math is fun and doesn't always end up in the, you know, hundredth position in the, in the decimal place. And so they're like, well, instead of just rounding, we're just gonna take that little slice off and we're actually gonna put it into account because it's real money. And they're just kind of mathematically creating money out of nowhere. Um, spoiler alert, there's a bug in their software and instead of, uh, they move the decimal place over by one, and so they end up basically stealing millions of dollars in uh, the course of, you know, a couple hours. <laughs> um, he makes the argument that, you know, I'm just, we're just taken from the penny jar. It's just the, it, it doesn't matter. Who, who really cares? And she keeps repeating, but it's not yours. But it's stealing. It, it, it does still hit at what people need to think about when you are writing software and what powers that you do have. Here's another one from, from, um, from Dilbert. We can discuss um, the, the usage of Dilbert in, in general, but I, I think the point here is interesting, which is 
Wally, I discovered a deadly safety flaw in our product. Who should I inform? No one. The stock would plunge and we'd have massive layoffs. Your career would be ruined. But my negligence could cause the deaths of a dozen customers. The first dozen is always the hardest. So, <clears throat> unlike the, the Office Space video, where the ethical violation here is very legally stealing thing, uh, well, they're breaking the law in, in stealing thing, um, and, you know, hyperbole aside in this particular comic, imagine that you did find a security flaw in your product. If you went public with it, what effect would that have? Would that destroy the company? And then anyone who's been using the software could be um, uh, potentially exposed to even more risk because now the flaw is out there and people know about it. Do you approach your manager and talk to your manager about this flaw and see about getting it repaired as quickly as possible within the chain of command? Do you go directly to the developer if you happen to know who it was, if there's someone on your team or someone you know in the general vicinity? And you can say, hey, look, I found this flaw. And that person's like, holy smokes. And then they go and do a patch themselves that hopefully gets rolled out. I mean, what's the right thing to do here? Um, where do you start? Um, conflict is not an easy thing for many people to deal with. You might not want to be, you might not be a person who feels comfortable confronting um, a mentor or confronting the developer themselves and saying, hey, I found this flaw. There's a problem here you don't necessarily want to be the whistleblower and you know you're running to anderson cooper to say hey look i found this flaw in this particular piece of software and it's horrible and he's like why are you talking to me um where do you start the software engineering code of ethics was put together by the acm and the ieee a joint task force between to the association for computing machinery and the computer society of the ieee which are our two main professional bodies and the purpose of this code of ethics is to try to help give some guidance to software engineers in these dilemmas. Now, let me, let me read the, the, the preamble here. Software engineers shall commit themselves to making the analysis, specification, design, development, testing, and maintenance of software a beneficial and respected profession. In accordance with their commitment to the health, safety, and welfare of the public, the software engineers shall adhere to the eight principles, which, Sounds like you're joining a fraternity or sorority, I suppose, but um, what this is trying to get at is, um, when you look at the code of ethics, there are these eight large categories where the different um, clauses fall. And the idea is, the higher the, in this, this chart, one to eight, one being the most important, those are the clauses that you should give the most credence to when trying to give yourself some, some help in de defining out uh, how you might handle something. Um, so the, the eight categories, the eight principles are public, client and employer, product, judgment, management, profession, colleague, itself. Noticing that it starts with your responsibility to the public, then your responsibility to your employer and your client, and then the quality of the product, and then your um, personal biases with judgment, and then how you treat others as a managerial, in a managerial role, how you treat the profession, how you portray software engineers to the public at large, how you help your colleagues, and then self-improvement yourself, lifelong. Um, so, uh, we have those eight principles. Uh, they are intended for basically anyone. They, they are written in, in plain language. They're meant for managers, stakeholders, developers, students, um, policymakers, anyone, um, to try and give some context as to what software engineers should be doing um, when being responsible to society. Um, this is a clutch quote from the, from the code. It is not intended that the individual parts of the code be used in isolation to justify errors of omission or commission. The list of principles and clauses is not exhaustive. Clauses should not be read as separating the acceptable from the unacceptable in professional conduct in all practical situations. The code is not a simple ethical algorithm that generates ethical decisions. I love that statement. We're going to come back to it. In some situations, standards may be in tension with each other or with standards 
uh, from other sources. These situations require the software engineer to use ethical judgment to act in a manner which is most consistent with the spirit of the code of ethics and professional practice given the circumstances. The code is not a simple ethical algorithm that generates ethical decisions. I guarantee what most computer scientists probably want, what engineers want is, I, I am royally screwed, what do I do? And you want a choose your adventure book <laughs> where you say, I have problem, oh, it's problem seven. Eh, problem seven if you wish to get fired turn to page 22 if you wish to do the right thing turn to page 72 oh good and it tells you what to do no no not at all in fact what you'll find is that um you can compare a lot of what you see in the, the code of ethics to other historical codes however you might want to, to, to think about that from from um uh from various like organizations or, or 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 how you think about where it's like here's some best practices it just so happens that uh point 1.7 and point 2.2 kind of conflict a little bit and you might look at them and go huh this says one thing this says another thing which one do i do um what it's going to tell you is this is the one that matters for the public or this is the one that matters for your client and employer and you have to kind of start figuring things out. So it's tricky. It is tricky. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's go through the principles and go through some of the clauses and talk about what we see in these and how we're going to apply them. So the public. First and foremost, your responsibility as a software engineer is to ensure the safety of the public. If you know for a fact that there is something going on in the piece of software that is going to endanger others, your responsibility to do something about it, to raise a flag, to inform, to fix, whatever it might be. The public comes first. Then comes your responsibility to the client and your employer. You are an employee of a company, presumably. As a, I mean, you could be self-employed, but you have a responsibility to create value for your company, and you have a responsibility to meet the desires and needs of your stakeholders. So as long as you're not endangering the public, um, you really need to do what you're told, so to speak. Um, in general, you, you, know, you should not be um, putting your putting, you know, personal bias into how, uh, what a customer says they need or what they want. Uh, product, you should ensure that your whatever products you create are of the highest quality that you can. Basically, don't, don't, don't go halfway. You know, you want to meet professional standards. You want to make good stuff. Your judgment. Uh, maintain integrity and independence in their professional judgment. If um, your company gets a contract with some other nonprofit organization to build a piece of software, and you're on that company's or that nonprofit's board of directors, you probably shouldn't work on the software. Also, if you if you leave a company voluntarily, you probably are under some sort of NDA, non-disclosure agreement, not reveal current products or anything like that to the new company for whatever period of time. You need to obey those. Management. Software engineering managers and leaders shall subscribe to and promote ethical approach to management. Um, if you're in a managerial position, you should treat your engineers with respect and not have 80 hour work week. You should, you know, have reasonable expectations during um, during times like this for remote work, understanding what people's needs are so that they are producing the best code that they can. If um, you'll find that when you have a team that feels comfortable with, with each other and feels comfortable with the management position um, and the policies around that, that basically better things happen. So be kind to each other, basically. Uh, profession, software engineers shall advance the integrity and reputation of the professional consistent with the public interest. Don't go meme posting all the time about horrible, how horrible software engineers are on Twitter and Facebook and whatever like that. I mean, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, do, you could argue, does it really matter? But if you profess to be a member of a profession and all you do is badmouth that profession, that doesn't really reflect well on you or the profession itself. Are there meme-worthy stuff that happens in programming? Oh, of course there are. 
And of course, you know, we have fun with it and things like that. But there's a line. And, you know, as a, if you're employed by a company, let's say you're employed by Microsoft. Do you think Microsoft is cool with you getting on Twitter and just bashing MS products the entire time before you roll into work? I mean, I work for, technically, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and I get reminders about things that, you know, what I should or should not uh, post on social media because on some level I'm a representative of the Commonwealth and, and the University of Virginia, and there cannot be any way that anything I post could be misconstrued as coming from some official channel. So there are rules of propriety that you need to follow. We all know by now through um, software process slides that when we work together as a team, better things happen. So if you have someone on your team that is struggling, instead of you necessarily doing all their work for them, or you know, like, oh, I'll just do it myself, that sort of thing, we as a, as a body of software engineers grow and improve when we aid our colleagues in their own learning. Um, so when you're on a team and someone is struggling with something, it's going to be better in the long run to help them, help them learn and to help you know, bring them up to the level that you need them to be as opposed to trying to either belittle them or move, remove their work or whatever like that. They'll get a sense of accomplishment. They will become more productive on the team. You might be in line for that promotion now, whatever it might be. Um, again, be kind to each other. That That is important. And be kind to yourself. So participate in lifelong learning regarding the practice of the profession and promote an ethical approach to the practice of the profession. So we all know that software changes rapidly. Uh, in our class, we're learning Python and Django. There's a very good chance that Django will be legacy technology. I mean, could argue it's somewhat legacy on some level, but I mean, we move pretty fast in software development. You need to commit to learning as you go and to learning how to learn. You know, you need to figure out how to go about, okay, this is the new, this is the new hotness. This is the new thing that we are using. How am I going to go about picking this up to, to stay relevant in the, so those are the eight principles. I'm going to dive into a few of the clauses for each of these and talk about how they apply um, in the next few slides. So these are just some examples. So uh, clause 1.02, in public, moderate the interests of the software engineer, the employer, the client, and the users with the public. So just a broad statement of there's a balance and you need to think about it. 1.03, approve software only if they have a well-founded belief that it is safe, meets specifications. So again, this, this goes to a quality product and that you are only, you're only putting good out in the world, uh, to quote Jeff Kanata. Uh, disclose to appropriate persons or authorities any actual potential danger to the user, public, or environment. So right after 1.03, we have the whistleblower clause of 1.04. Um, so it's there. Um, pretty close to the top. Disclose to appropriate persons or authorities any actual or potential danger. We have to take the public's safety seriously. Uh, under client and employer, 2.01, provide service in the areas of competence, being honest and forthright about limitations of experience and education. Don't BS people about what you know and don't know. You are, this sounds terrible, you're an asset to the company, right? And I don't mean like you're like a chair or a desk, but your experience, your, your ability is something that brings value. Be proud of what you bring to the table and don't try to, you know, BS your way into a corner because that's just going to be real bad for you and potentially bad for the product and potentially embarrassing for the employer. Be honest about what you know and, you know, go do self-improvement, but don't just uh, not knowingly use software that have obtained or retained either eagerly or unethically. I'm going to give you a minute. Uh, okay, so let's just say, of course, that when you're in a professional position, you have a job and you have money and, and that's good. 
and um, you should buy all your software. I know that as a as a poor star starving college student, this is harder to think about, particularly when snaring at some of the packages of software that are extremely expensive that you think you need for whatever it is that you're trying to do. But we are trying to build software that other people's build, other people, uh, excuse me, we're trying to build software that other people want to use and buy. Like, let's be, let's be kind to each other. It, you know, if someone built something that we need to use, let's pay for it. Now, I'm not going to say that when I was in college, I didn't happen to appropriate certain bits and bytes that do certain things with some reasonable frequency. But I know better now, and now I can teach you that, um, you know, there are deals out there, and there are free and open uh, source solutions, things like that. So be good about that. Um, keep private any confidential information gained in your professional work. So again, uh, if you're working with uh, financial data, it's possible you get access to some real financial data. We need to keep that, we need to keep that in confidence. The product, strive for a high quality, acceptable cost, and reasonable schedule. Do good software, charge the right amount of money, finish it on time. That's kind of what that's getting at. Uh, identify, define, and address ethical, economic, cultural, legal, and environmental issues related to work profit projects. We are going to do um, a, a whole video kind of along those lines in a little bit because uh, in, in a future video uh, when we talk about things like when you're writing machine learning algorithms, um, how are you taking bias into account? Um, race, gender, socioeconomic statics. Um, what are you doing? Uh, so we will talk about identifying those ethical, economic, cultural, legal I issues uh, in the future. Ensure that they are qualified for any project for which they work. So this goes back to the one from client employer. Make sure you're building stuff that you are qualified to build. Ensure appropriate method is used for any project. If you are the project manager and you are doing your uh, polar chart and it's screaming you need to do plan driven, but at heart you're just a scrum person, you just want to do agile, you need to trust your professional instinct here and say, okay, well, the chart says we should be doing plan driven because we're building space shuttle software, but gosh darn it, I wanted to do pure extreme programming. Maybe, maybe follow the lessons that we have and, and you know, use the proper method for, for things. For judgment, maintain professional objectivity with respect to any software-related documents you're asked to evaluate. If you are handed um, a piece of code, you're handed a, a design document, and it's from a mortal enemy, you still should treat it with respect and give an honest opinion. It's like, oh, it's from that person, and therefore it must be garbage. I mean, come on. We're, we're beyond that. We're adults. We can look at a piece of work and evaluate it appropriately. Don't engage in deceptive financial practices such as bribery. Glad we're taking a stand on bribery and double billing. <laughs> um, you know, you charge for a piece of software, uh, X amount for six months of work. And then they say, oh, you say, well, I'm not done yet. I need to charge more when you're effectively charging for the same piece of software that you already have been paid for. So. Don't be horrible to people. Um, disclose all concerned parties those conflicts of interest that cannot be reasonably or, or, or escaped. So back to my example about being on the board for a nonprofit that hires a company, or um, I mean, maybe you have to be on the team because you're you're a key person. Or maybe you're you're maybe you are fulfilling the role of on-site customer. You just need to be you just need to be upfront and say you know this is this is the situation. Um, you know, this is a potential conflict. I mean, an example for me is I'm on the board of directors for um, a uh, for a, for Sammy's school, and my wife taught there for a little bit, and so you know, I reasonably recused myself from discussions about teacher pay. It's not unreasonable. This is something that we just we should do, and we should recognize management. Um, five point oh two. Ensure that software engineers are informed of standards before they're, in, before they're being held to them. If you're going to make people build code a certain way, maybe you should tell them what that certain way is before you start yelling at them. I mean, you know, a lot of the things in management are being uh, a good leader. Um, 
ensure that um that that um your employees know the policies at the at the company. So what are the HR policies? What are the password policies? What are the security policies uh, for getting in and out of the building, for what they're allowed to take home, for what they must uh, VPN for? There's a reason that, that these protections exist, even though they might be inconvenient for the software engineer, there are almost always legal reasons and safety reasons for protecting this data. You might not agree with how it's being done, you might think that, oh, there's so much you know, other ways we could do it, yada, yada, yada. You don't know the entire process for why a particular methodology was chosen. You very well could be right, but it could also be wrong. So in some cases, you just should suck it up and do it, and it's management's role to make sure that folks are doing that. So don't come down on them because they say, hey, you really need to VPN into the system whenever you're dealing with sensitive data. Assign work only after taking into account appropriate contributions of education experience. Again, we're getting back to the people have certain expertise in certain parts of software development, language, platforms, whatever. Make sure everyone knows what the playing field is and everyone is you know, working on the things they should be working on. That doesn't mean don't train in other ways, but be honest about what you know you can do, right? The profession. Promote the public knowledge of software engineering. Holy smokes. We could do an entire lesson just on this. You have seen a meme or some characterization of software engineers as being someone shoved in their parents' basement in the dark, glow in the dark. Um, I know they exist. UFO posters slamming seven Mountain Dews all at the same time with nine different types of Dorito chips with the matrix background while they're hacking into the NSA while also writing some code in, in white space to then uh, upload to the banking. You've seen it. You, you have. And we fight against that all the time. Software engineering is not that. Software engineering is incredibly social. Software engineering is working with teams. It's talking to the customer. It's understanding needs. It's building solutions. It's you have to be someone who can go into a scenario where someone's going to approach you with potential domain and content knowledge that you have no experience with, and you have to find a way to understand where they're coming from and then help them build a solution. I mean, that's very different. And also, you know, we are, we as a community, we have challenges absolutely about underrepresented minorities in in computing but it's something we are working on and i think that something at uva we we work on we, we do pretty well in trying to be as inclusive as possible and 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 and, and bring in uh, a, a good represented representation of, of society into into our profession because how else are we going to build good software if we're not seeing who we're building software for it's 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 frustrating to to see the public perception of our profession, um, even though we need to try and push back on it as much as we, gently, but we do need to push back at it. Um, should not promote your own interest. It's like, oh, you're buying software from Microsoft. Did you know I had this side job, which is really hot? Okay, you know, don't um, obey laws governing work. <laughs> um, Take responsibility for detecting, correcting, reporting errors in software. If you find a bug, we're all in one team, report it. Avoid association with business or organizations which are in conflict with this code. So, the code has come out against bribery and now being associated with the mafia or some other organization, however you, you know, don't work for Dr. Doom. Don't work for Thanos. So, you, yeah. I'm glad we cleared that up. Colleagues, assist colleagues in professional development. Back to what I said before. Teams work better when everyone works together and we can bring our colleagues uh, up to the standards that we want them to be and we help them and we, we get, help them get the training that they need because it's just good. It's good for everyone. Credit fully the work of others and refrain from taking undue credit. Look, there's a ton of code out there. There's a ton of code that's been released publicly. There's a ton of code that's been released under different licenses. 
we are all professional developers. We know that we should and can find acceptable solutions to problems. We shouldn't be redesigning solutions all the time. That's not good for creating, uh, you know, adding defects into the world because something that's more mature, that's been tested more and more, that's something you should look at and try and incorporate. But credit the people who built it, for heaven's sake. You need to start getting in this in this habit now in 3240. Now, I'm not going to speak for any other class that you have about what code you're allowed to use or things like that. But as a software engineer, you don't rebuild solutions unless you have to. You want to find proven, tested things and build those in such a way to create the software solution that you need and do this in a legal ethical and responsible way. We'll talk about licensing later on and what you are allowed to use and not allowed to use, but let's at least start with citing things. Review the work of others in an objective, candid, and properly documented way. Make sure that if you are looking at someone's code, you are giving good feedback. Be objective. And finally, for yourself. Further the knowledge of developments in the analysis specific, uh, keep learning about software engineering. Improve your ability to create safe, reliable, and usable and useful quality software at a reasonable cost. Again, be a better software engineer. Um, basically, don't be stagnant. Recognize that the profession changes and that you need to change with it and that you need to recognize that um, new ethical challenges appear, that new um, biases appear, that new technologies appear and that um, the possible solution set is going to shift. And that you need to be able to shift with it. You shouldn't always say, oh, I was always able to solve this with XML, or I was always able to solve this with a facial recognition algorithm. And all of a sudden you might say, you might find out later on that, you know, XML, that's great, but you know, there's better ways of doing it moving forward. Facial recognition, that's great, but the old algorithms, well, they were written by white guys. And so sometimes they're not as good. And so you can't just say, well, we're just going to use that algorithm. No, that you, you need to recognize that this is a problem that was created and we need to ad address it um, just for an equity standpoint. And that recognize that personal violations of the code are inconsistent with being a professional software engineer. Are there software engineering police that are going to show up at your door? Well, not software engineering police. Depending on what you do, maybe real police, I guess. Um, but this is a like an internal ethical thing that you need to internalize this, recognize that as a professional software engineer, this is your job. Now, what is it in the code? Where to get help? There's not a hotline at the bottom of the code that says, you know, if you're in trouble, dial one. For the, you, know, you, you do kind of have to read the code and use the principles, the, the principles and the clauses in there to help guide your future actions. There's no information about who to report violations to. Um, <clears throat> in, a, in an organization, usually there's a chain that you can report software issues to. A, a scrum master, a project lead, a uh, manager, whatever it might be. And for things that are happening in the organization, such as the manager is requiring you to work 80 hours a week, there tends to be a, an HR hotline or something along the way. Where to get advice and support in a confrontation with an employer? Um, it's tough. I mean, there are, there are message boards out there where people post, I mean, a varying quality and degree, but there are professional software developer message boards where things like this are discussed. And so, you know, you could find some, some space to get a little bit of, 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 um, advice there. Um, but also just talking to a trusted friend who's also a software engineer, maybe another company if that's possible, to get just kind of a, a sounding board. It's, it's good to have that sort of support network. You'll find that professional conferences are one way of building that support network. Um, so that's really important to do. You know, if, if you're a developer and you stay isolated within your company, you might not necessarily know what is going on at large. So while some of these conferences, even the virtual ones, might seem kind of silly sometimes, there is a lot of good reason to go um, from a just a professional standpoint. Um, what are the consequences of violating the code? I mean, you could be fired. Um, you also could break laws. Um, you also could like not sleep well at night, hopefully. 
um, depending on the, the, the severity or, or the type of thing that, that's occurred. Um, what do you do if, if, if there's a conflict between com client and employer? <sighs> there aren't good answers to all these. There aren't. And um, trying to find the right path through some of these scenarios can be difficult. So one of the things that we are going to do as part of the guided practice for this week is to look at some case studies. And we're going to evaluate those case studies and ask you to apply the clauses and try and figure out what you would do in these scenarios. Are they cut and dry? No, of course not. Those would be boring. Um, we're going to give you some that you really have to think about. But take some time when you get a chance to think about this, that as software engineers, we have a responsibility. Um, you know, ju just as you might point to our friends in civil engineering who are building a bridge, you say, okay, you need to build that bridge and make sure it doesn't collapse. And that, you know, from a very surface level perspective, you can think about the quality of the product there. But from our, our perspective, you know, we have to think about the same thing, quality of the software we put out there and what are the ramifications of that software. So I know it's kind of a heavy topic. Um, we're going to keep talking about it and, and dip into some more specific ex examples, but take a look at the software engineering code of ethics. If you have any questions, bring them up and let's talk about them because that's the way that we, we grow. So. Hope you're doing well. Take care. I'll see you in the next video. Ah.